with all of our heart and turn from our wicked ways. Lord, we ask forgiveness and we pray, Lord, that you would lead us in that and show us by your spirit, draw us to you, back to you. I pray that the church in America would draw back to you, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for all you've done for us, dear Jesus. Thank you for dying for our sins, for the suffering you went through for us. And I thank you that you do discipline those you love, Lord. So I pray that we'll learn from this experience that we're going through and come out of this closer to you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. to each of you from wherever you are. My name is David Fogel, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Tri-County Alliance Church. And I have to acknowledge to you that this just feels different. It feels different for me, and I'm sure it feels different for you. Uh, this is a different day in which we live, in which uh, all of our lives are affected, and um, including the way we do church. And so uh, we're privileged to be able to, while we're not able to meet together, we're privileged to be able to put this uh, together for you uh, through the technology so that you might be ministered to from the Word of God. And I'm so thankful that um, uh, we have uh, some of our musicians here uh, who were able to minister as well as our excellent tech team that is making all of this possible uh, for us. So it's different. We don't like to feel isolated. We're not made to be isolated. We're, we're made, the Bible tells us, to live in community. And uh, this is just the next best thing for us to be able to do that. Uh, they're telling us we need to stay six feet apart, which I understand probably for you Scandinavians is still maybe a little too close. Um, that's what I meant to say in the video the other day. It might have come out different, but uh, it was funnier the way I just said it. So I'm grateful that you're here with us, and uh, I don't know of a better place to turn uh, during times like this as the church, as God's people, uh, as people who trust in something greater, bigger than ourselves and the circumstances we face in this world, than to the very word of God itself, uh, the Bible. The church needs to be the church today more than ever before. In order for the church to be the church, we must firmly stand on the word of God. In order to firmly stand on the word of God, we have to know the word of God. 
And as many as you know who have been worshiping with us over these weeks, we have uh, undergone a sermon series through the entire book, through the entire Bible entitled The Journey, where we go through the Bible one book at a time. One Sunday, one book. We're just getting started, and we're about eight books in, and so I invite you to turn with me to a book of the Bible that very much has a message for us today. It is a message for our time, and so I invite you to turn to the book of Ruth um, with me uh, this morning. And I am, as much as I wish I could, for sake of time, will not read the whole book. It's four chapters long, but I will read the first five verses of the first chapter. Ruth chapter one, please follow along as I read verses one through five. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man uh, from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Euphrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpha and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Food and family. That's what we hear about today. Food, the, the grocery stores remaining open. We have to make sure we have enough food and we have to make sure that we're taking care of our family. Food and family are what we hear today. You need both to survive in this world. If you go without food, your body will starve. If you go without family, your soul will starve. If, if you don't have food, you will do whatever it takes to get it. And the same is true with family. That's what the book of Ruth is all about. When Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi, returned to Bethlehem from Moab, they were broken and alone. Both had lost their husbands. It is hard to imagine a more desperate situation than two widows. Both alone and broken. Trying to make it through in, this, in the ancient world. One of them old, one of them young. Just trying to make it through. And the fact that one of the widows, Ruth, is from a hated race means that their situation was indeed a desperate one. Uh, the story, the text, uh, shows us how God began to meet their need for food and family. And he does it as he so often does through this unlikely hero. A man by the name of Boaz, a prosperous man of noble character who was successful and well respected as a farmer in the fields outside of Bethlehem. And, and it is this man, Boaz, in the book of Ruth that points us so beautifully to Jesus Christ, which is where we will finish today. The book gives us a glimpse into the lives of godly but ordinary people who lived during the turbulent period of the judges. We talked about the, the book of Judges last week where uh, Israel, after uh, gaining the promised land, had lost their spiritual compass and everyone was doing what they saw fit in their own eyes. They lost sight, sight of the God who brought them there, who led them, who loved them. And here in the book of Ruth, we have what's called often an oasis of faithfulness in the middle of a spiritual desert. A beautiful story of faithfulness in an age marked by idolatry and unfaithfulness. And in the first five verses of the book that we read together, 
we find that this beautiful romance of Ruth is set against the, the dark, dark background of the apostasy and the oppression of foreigners during the period of, of Judges. Because of a local famine, a man from Bethlehem, a town that we're very familiar with as Christians, named Elimelech. He took his wife Naomi and his two sons, Malon and Kilian, to go temporarily to a place called Moab. Moab was about 50 miles away from Bethlehem on the east side of the Dead Sea. The town of Moab was named after Moab, whose story is told in Genesis chapter 19. He was the, the son of Lot, Abraham's nephew, by an incestuous union with his oldest daughter. I mean, what a serious dilemma Naomi was in to be a widow and a foreigner in Moab. We have to know something, not just about her family, but something about the inhabitants of the land in which she lived. The Moabites were known to be more settled and more civilized, where others that Israel had to encounter were more wild and nomadic and violent. Moab did not openly fight against Israel. They were more subtle. While the other groups were known for their hostility toward Israel, Moab was known for their subtle hospitality toward God's people. It was dangerous and subtle and compromised. Like, hey, come and enjoy our lifestyle. Come and worship our gods and compromise with us. This was Moab, the place where Naomi now lived, a lonely widow. It is hard to imagine a more dangerous place to which a man could lead his wife and family or a more dangerous place in which he could leave them. In verse 3 of the first chapter, we learn that Elimelech died. And so Naomi is left with her two sons. Her two sons, while in Moab, both married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other named Ruth, the namesake of the book. And after about ten years, both her sons then died. So Naomi is now not only left without her husband, but also without her two sons. It's just her and her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. Naomi, who is a, a faithful uh, believer in the one true God, urges her daughters at this point to go back to their mother's home, that God will bless them there. Go back to the life that you knew before. Don't worry about me. I'll be okay. Go start over. Go rebuild your life somewhere else. In verse 14, uh, there's this emotional time where there's much weeping and Orpah uh, kisses uh, her mother-in-law uh, goodbye and she went on her way and back to her old life and to her gods. But Ruth clung to Naomi and there's this moving tribute in verses 17 and 18 of chapter 1 where Ruth says to Naomi, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. Love and loyalty to her mother-in-law. Now today, when someone says, hey, let me tell you about my mother-in-law, there might be a different story. When someone talks about their mother-in-law today, we expect some kind of negative statement or humorous story because the mother-in-law caricature has become the standard centerpiece of ridicule and comedy. There is no shortage of really good mother-in-law jokes out there. I know a few. I will refrain from telling them because my mother-in-law is probably watching. And I love her deeply. <laughs> but the book of Ruth tells a different story. Ruth loved her mother-in-law, Naomi. 
Recently widowed, Ruth begged to stay with Naomi wherever she went, even though it mean leaving her homeland. And in these heartfelt words, Ruth said, your people will be my people and your God, my God. Naomi finally agrees and Ruth traveled with her back to Bethlehem. Now, not much is, is said about Naomi except that she worshiped the one true God and that she loved and cared for her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Obviously, Naomi's life was a powerful witness to the reality of the one true God. Ruth was drawn to her, and not only was Ruth drawn to Naomi, but Ruth was drawn to the God that Naomi worshipped. And that leaves me with a big question that I have for you and for me. It is the way that we carry ourselves, the way that we live and love and care, is it so winsome that those around us are drawn to the God that we worship. In the months and years that followed, God led Ruth, this young widow, Moabite widow, to a good and honorable man named Boaz, whom she ultimately married. And as a result of that, Ruth became the great grandmother of King David and then the ancestor uh, in the line of Jesus, the Messiah himself. What a profound impact Naomi's life made. And Ruth herself shows that Gentiles, that us, that outsiders could believe in and be accepted by the one true God. The book gives a, a partial lineage to uh, 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 to the line of David and then uh, so ultimately to Christ showing us that Gentile blood was in the line of the one who would become the Savior to all mankind. If you'll allow me to just get through some of the technical stuff and then I want to finish as I mentioned with pointing us to Jesus. This is uh, might be helpful to you. Uh, as far as the authorship of the book, the author is unknown to us. Some suggest Samuel. As far as the date, uh, written circa 1000 BC, and all the, although the events uh, of the book happened during the period of Judges, latter part of the 12th century BC, the book itself was not written until later. You notice in chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, that the, the author felt compelled to explain customs that were practiced then, but are no longer practiced now. Like the practice that's described there is uh, one of handing over one of your sandals to the other party involved to solidify a business transaction, to symbolize the handing over of the right of redemption. The last verses of the book trace Ruth's descendants only to King David, uh, in chapter 4, 18 to 22, strongly suggesting that the book was written during King David's reign. If it was written later, we would expect the genealogy to be extended beyond David to include others like his son Solomon and perhaps others down the line. Uh, the book in one sentence, if you could just, if you could just capsulize it all in one sentence, it, it could be something like this, that a loyal daughter-in-law gives a clear, real-life picture of God's faithfulness, love, and care. A loyal daughter-in-law gives us a clear, real-life picture of God's faithfulness, love, and care. Uh, the blueprint of the book, it, it kind of reads like a four-act play. Four chapters of the book, a four-act play. Uh, first, the, you have w Ruth remains loyal to Naomi in chapter 1. And then secondly, you have Ruth gleams in Boaz's field in chapter 2. And then third, you have Ruth uh, follows Naomi's plan, chapter 3. And then fourth, uh, finally, Ruth and Boaz are married in chapter 4. Now the fun part. Uh, Jesus in every book. 
And we've pointed to Jesus in every book of the Bible along the way in this journey. And he's certainly not hard to find in the book of Ruth. Jesus in the book of Ruth is our kinsman redeemer. We see Jesus through the man Boaz. Boaz was a truly great man. Some have commented that the book of Ruth could just as well have been called the book of Naomi because the book begins and ends with her. And, and that's true. But you could also make a case for calling this the book of Boaz because he shines just as brightly as the two women do. If you and I made a list of the greatest men in the Bible, which would certainly include names like Abraham and David and Moses and Daniel on that list, but Boaz belongs there too. Good pastors like Ray Pritchard and David Platt and others have articulated what's often called the gospel according to Boaz. An appropriate description, the gospel according to Boaz, the way that he, Boaz, helps and rescues Ruth very much illustrates the way the Lord Jesus Christ rescues and helps uh, you and me from the text in Ruth chapter 2. First of all, we find that Boaz finds the outcast, as Jesus does. He finds the outcast in verses 4 through 9. He greets his workers, God be with you. They say, God be with you. We see right away what kind of a man uh, he is and how he treats those who work for him. And he spots this foreigner woman from Moab, Moab, and he asks about her. He's told she's a woman from Moab, and the Moabites were bitter enemies of the Jewish people. They were very much outsiders. In fact, back in Deuteronomy 23.3, it offered this blunt warning that no Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even in the 10th generation. God could not have been more clear. His people were to have nothing to do with the Moabites. Don't live among them. Don't marry them. Don't follow their gods. And don't invite them to worship with you. At this moment in the story, it appears that Boaz decided to ignore those warnings in deference to the greater law, the law of the kinsman redeemer. Might I remind us that we ourselves, at one point, were enemies of God. We were outsiders to his family. Because of our own sin and our rebellion and turning away from him. But what a blessing to know that it was God who took the initiative, Romans 5, 8, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He finds the outcast. Secondly, he favors the weak. He favors the weak in verses 10 through 13 of chapter 2. In verse 10, uh, at this, uh, Ruth before Boaz, she bowed down with her face to the ground and she exclaimed, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? And then in verse 13, she says, May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord. Two times she, she uses the word favor in reference to how Boaz treated her. It means to be, to be gracious, favor in the Bible, to be gracious, to show unexpected, undeserved kindness to those who deserve nothing. She's an outsider. Not only does he find her, but he kindly welcomes her. It's interesting, as many commentators of the book of Ruth have noted, that, that nothing is said in the book about Ruth's outward appearance. Well, we, we kind of assume today that she was a, a beautiful woman on the outside, and that may have been true, but that's not mentioned. It is her character. 
her heart, her love, her perseverance, her loyalty that's noticed in the book. He finds the outcast. He favors the weak. And thirdly, he feeds the hungry. He feeds the hungry. At mealtime, Boaz told her in verse 14 of chapter 2, he says, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. That's what Jesus does for us. He fills us to overflowing. We have plenty left over. Not only does Boaz find Ruth, not only does he welcome her, not only does he protect her, he now allows her to feast at his table. Boaz understood the power of a shared meal. There is tremendous power in a meal shared with other people. I mean, it's one thing if I were to come up to you, if I were to knock on your front door or pass you on the street and say, I am desperately hungry. And you said, OK, Dave, and you reached into your wallet and you pulled out a $20 bill and said, here's 20 bucks. There's a McDonald's down the street. Go get yourself something to eat. That's one thing. But it's something entirely different to say, Dave, I know you're hungry. You're desperately hungry. So come to my home, sit at my table, and share a meal with me. The first response says, let me supply your need. But the second response says, not only let me supply your need, but let me include you as part of my family. God, through his son Jesus, welcomes us to feast at his table. He welcomes anyone into his family who come to him with sincere faith. The kinsman redeemer. In the law of the kinsman redeemer, the, the kinsman redeemer, that person uh, had a, a responsibility. And that responsibility generally involved three things. One was redeeming family property that changed ownership. And second was marrying a childless widow, keeping her from being sold into slavery and to raise up children in her dead husband's name. According to the law, if there's no brother to raise her children in the name of the deceased. Responsibility then fell to the next of kin and then they refused and you'd go to the next one. It had to be something the kinsman redeemer was willing to do. No one was forced to do so against their own will. So redeem family property to marry the childless widow and raise the children. And thirdly, to avenge the blood of a murdered relative. Ruth indicated her desire to have Boaz. And Boaz had given every evidence of his willingness to perform the responsibilities of the kinsman redeemer. And he takes her in chapter 4, and he marries her, and he protects her, and he provides for her. And they have a son together named Obed, who goes in the line of David, and ultimately the line of the Messiah himself, as we see in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5. Boaz, as the kinsman redeemer, serves as a beautiful type of Christ to us. And that number one, he was a blood relative. This, this kinsman redeemer opportunity wasn't just open to anybody, any Joe along the street. It had to be a kinsman redeemer. It had to be one of you. I love Romans chapter 1 verse 3 that tells us in reference to Jesus as the son of and as to his human nature, was a descendant of David. And then Hebrews 2.14 that talks about how Christ shared in our humanity. He shared in our flesh and blood. He became one of us. He became our kinsman that he might redeem us. He was a blood relative. In other words, he had the right to redeem. He had the authority. Secondly, 
Not only was a blood relative, but he had the price with which to purchase the forfeited inheritance. He had the means, he had the price that needed to be paid. I love 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 that tells us that it was not by perishable things like silver and gold that we were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without defect or blemish. In other words, he had the resources to redeem. Not just the right, but also the resources. And thirdly, he was willing. He was willing. It's one thing to be a blood relative. It's one thing to have the means and the resources and the price to pay. But if you're not willing, it doesn't happen. Boaz was willing. Christ was willing. In other words, he had the resolve to redeem. I love Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, which is a, a, a quotation from Psalm chapter 40. But speaking of when Christ came into the world, he says, here I am. Here I am, as it is written, I have come to do the will of God. He was willing, he had the resolve. What a difference. Boaz makes all the difference in the story. The first chapter of the book of Ruth, if you read it, it is a really sad and miserable chapter. It contains nothing but backsliding and death and unhappiness. And not coincidentally, chapter 1 never so much as even mentions the name of Boaz, the mighty kinsman redeemer. And as for us, any chapters in our life that are written without naming our heavenly Boaz are bound to be filled with fear and frustration and failure. Boaz is finally introduced in Ruth chapter 2, and from then on, the emphasis is on him. He's mentioned 10 times in chapter 2, and 10 more times in chapter 3 and 4, a total of 20 times. And once Boaz is introduced into the story of Ruth, he dominates it as the royal kinsman redeemer, the mighty man of wealth who was ready, willing, and able to redeem. He takes poor outsider Ruth and puts her in the family of God. Boaz for Ruth then, like Jesus for us now, had the right to redeem, the resources to redeem, and the resolve to redeem. In the same way, once we introduce the Redeemer into the story of human, human life, once we introduce the Redeemer into the story of our life, he is bound to become the center of everything. And we're better off for it. Well, so what, as I close? Where do I fit in all of this? You know, if Boaz points us to the Lord Jesus Christ, then outsider Ruth points us to ourselves. When the Apostle Paul wanted to make the point that in Romans 3.23, that all have sinned, all, there is no exception, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He prefaced it with this phrase in verse 22 of Romans chapter 3, for there is no difference. There's no difference. No difference between rich and poor, no difference between young and old, no difference between male or female, black, white, or brown, and in the deepest sense, no difference between Jews and Moabites. Boaz understood this truth, and he made Ruth part of his family. We all stand condemned by sin. We are all under the judgment of God. 
We all sin in different ways. You sin in ways that are different than perhaps I sin. But we are all sinners nonetheless. One preacher said, we're all in the same boat and the boat is sinking. And if God doesn't do something, then the entire human race will go down to destruction. But God did do something. He sent his perfect son, Jesus, as our kinsman redeemer to willingly pay the price that we could never afford, that our sins might be forgiven, that we might be welcomed into his family and enjoy a new life with him for both now and all of eternity. What a beautiful story of what grace looks like. So I urge you to read the book of Ruth and be encouraged. God is at work in the world. He is at work in the world today. And I've loved listening to many of you and hearing your stories of how God is using you to minister to people with words of comfort and hope and strength and testimony of your faith in God and how it's making a difference. God is up to something in the midst of this something deeper, something beautiful. And we have the privilege of discovering together what that is and joining him in that work. Let us together, my prayer is to be an oasis of faithfulness in the midst of a dark and difficult time. God can and will use us, you and me, as he used Naomi to point family, friends, and neighbors to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that is spoken to us today. Thank you for Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. Thank you, Lord, for price paid, hell canceled, heaven guaranteed, lives free and forgiven. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy upon our life. Thank you that you found us as outcasts, that you welcomed us and that you fed us. Thank you for the privilege of being part of your family through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, our kinsman redeemer. That we might feast at your table. And that we might share with others, those around us, the hope that fills us. Lord, I pray for your people today, that all those listening and watching, that you'd bless them, encourage them, strengthen them, that they might know your very real presence today in a powerful way. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Go serve your king.